Good morning, church. We're going to lift up our God in worship this morning. Won't you join us?
you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room. to you in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. God is good. And all the time. Amen. I'm going to change this up a little bit this morning on you, if you don't mind. I'm going to go into announcements first. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> for announcements, uh, I want to give a reminder, and maybe you don't know, next week um, we are going to have a meeting after church uh, for members to vote on uh, the proposed budget. So, um, this week the board will be meeting and uh, going over the proposed budget. So, by Thursday, hopefully you should get an email with that proposed budget. So, keep an eye out for that. Um, after church, or wait, uh, after if you are interested in flower baskets, please reach out to Richard. Um, he, we will be selling them, raising money for children's ministry, and they are $40. Um, <clears throat> also, men's, women's group, 6.30 to 8.30 on Tuesdays, reminder. Youth group tonight will be from 6 to 7. Um, also today we will be doing, is, is our second week um, and last week to uh, receive offering for John and Diane's uh, love offering. So uh, we want to honor them some more. So uh, <clears throat> this morning, I don't actually have a scripture, but I want to share a little uh, story with you to inspire you. Um, last night, me and my wife were watching a movie called The Blind, and it is the story of Phil Robertson and Kay Robertson um, if you haven't heard of them, they are the head of Duck Commander, the Duck Dynasty people. Um, so th th this is their story about how they met. But I, I don't want to go through the whole movie and give you any spoiler alerts in case you do watch it. But there's one point in the movie that um, I just wanted to share with you that I found ins inspiring and a reminder. Um, so Phil, I will give you the spoiler because he's obviously a... Uh, outspoken, very spoken uh, Christian, but he wasn't always. And at one point in the movie, um, <clears throat> uh, he, he's sitting with a pastor um, outside his broken down trailer, and the pastor's talking to him. And, <clears throat> and the pastor says to him, you know, w we all have stories, and a lot of our stories are about climbing up and r reaching a mountain or, um, you know, I mean, that's kind of like a man. You're always trying to, you know, build up and reach this plateau or this high point. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, and, and there's glory in that. But the, the point that just stuck out to me was what the pastor said next. He said to Phil, he leaned over and he said, Phil, <clears throat> this story is different. This story is about someone coming down. And what a beautiful reminder about what our Savior did. He came down from heaven to earth. He came down for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons he came down was, was for us. Right? And that spoke to Phil, and it spoke to me, and it reminded me 
especially after, after Easter, right? Our Savior came down from the heaven for me, for you, and for you, and for you, for all of us. And he's still here. We sang this morning about the Spirit. He left his Spirit here with us. And I love Lloyd. He's outspoken too. And he, and he says in men's group all the time, he reminds us. He gets a little fired up, right, Lloyd? But he says, guys, Jesus is right here. He says, he's sitting right beside me. I'm like, no, nah, Lloyd, he, he's over here. <laughs> but I just want to encourage you and remind you to remember who our God is. He came down from heaven to earth to show us the way. And then he went to the cross, to the grave, to the sky, so we can lift his name on high. Amen. 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 <clears throat> With that said, I want to call uh, the offertorians forward to receive our offering, and I'd like to pray. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to give you the glory this morning. We want to give you the glory every day, Lord, to think about the heavenly kingdom that is described in this holy book, Lord, that you gave us, and to think of all the glory, all the stuff that is up there, and how you left it to come down for us, Lord. That should humble us. And you did that so you could have an intimate relationship with us, Lord. There's nothing we can do to repay you, Lord, but we ask, Lord, that you would just receive our humble offerings this morning for your glory, for your kingdom. And we all said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Stand with me and sing this song.
rain Let forever Adore him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. I'm going to read from Second Peter, chapter one. This is verse 3 through 11. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And it is for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to that goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom 
such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope and came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence that roaring lion Declare the grave has no claim on me. Cause Jesus yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken. Morning, FAC. God is good, all the time. and all the time. God is good. So good, Donna. I love you. I love that Donna sits up front. If you're on the worship team, you're really happy Don Donna sits up front because she sings loud, and you hear, and it encourages you. It is a. It's a beautiful thing. Her harmonies. It is all good. Well, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, you know, there's a thousand things you could have chose to do today but you chose to gather as a church body and worship our Heavenly Father. And I thank you for that, because that's a big deal. So today's going to be a little different. Uh, church, we're going to have some family talk. That's what we're going to name this, little family talk. It's not going to be a traditional sermon, in a sense, that you've seen in the past. But um, as you guys know, the last few months of, at FAC, it's kind of been really hard for your leadership team. 
Uh, they've had weekly meetings that have lasted hours. Uh, at one point, now this was because after the meeting there was some, you know, further discussion, chit chat in the hallway. Uh, I got home at around 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> as a as a long day, right? Uh, but but their lives have been consumed. Their prayer lives have been consumed. Uh, every little ounce of their extra energy that they had, in a sense, was robbed uh, because we, we had to navigate through some very difficult decisions regarding the leadership of FAC. It was not an easy process. It has not been an easy process. It still will not be an easy process because there is work to do. During this time, relationships have been stretched. Emotions have been heavy. Logic has been questioned. And it has just been in a sense, a little chaotic. But we've come a long way. At one point, the district superintendent, Monty Wright, if you guys haven't uh, met him or heard him speak, he's an amazing man. I have the utmost respect for him. He came down and he met with the church board, and it was apart from me or John. John and I were not in this meeting. And during this conversation with Monty, the board did unanimously agree that it was time to move on from John as our lead pastor. And that was a tough conversation, but it was unanimous. Then Monty asked what I think is one of the most brilliant questions, which I think just, again, gives him qualification as a great leader. He asked this. He said, if Richard wasn't here, would you still move on from John? And I think that's a really important question because a lot of times we can see, think the grass is greener on the other side, right? Maybe we can enjoy one person. Uh, his style more than the other, right? And what they really needed to, to nail down is, even if Richard wasn't here, the guy that you so want to be your pastor, would you still make this decision? And it's really important for you guys to know that the board said yes. Even if Richard wasn't here, we do believe we needed to move on from John as a lead pastor. Now, that's hard to say, but you guys need to hear that, right? But also, in this journey, Monty asked them, since Richard is here, do you want him to be your pastor? And the board, which I found out quite a bit later, unanimously said, yes, we would love Richard to be our pastor. And so although the journey to get here, to get to, to this point where we are now, where I am, your lead pastor, has been challenging, and we have suffered losses, loss of relationship, uh, the loss of John as our lead pastor, the loss of Diane as our children's church worker. We've suffered losses of many kinds. I want you to know that I am excited to be your new pastor. <clears throat> and I feel so blessed to have the support of a strong governing board. This is, I've been on the governing board since I've been probably in my early 20s, so a long time over 10 years, and I've been on and off different periods, and this is by far the strongest governing board we've ever had. They're willing to speak their mind. They're even willing to smack this guy around, uh, which is obviously challenging for me, but an extremely strong governing board. I am thankful that I have the support of this church body. Um, you guys have come to me on multiple occasions letting you know that you support me in this role. I am so blessed to have support of my wife and my children to step into this role. Uh, I could not do it without them. But most importantly, I am so happy that I have the support of our Father in Heaven. Church, I want to let you know when I was 25 years old, I was called to be the lead pastor of FAC. And there was a season there where I questioned God. I said, God, are you sure? Because the way things are looking, I don't think I'll be the lead pastor of FAC. I think maybe you, maybe you misguided me or maybe I didn't hear right. Maybe there was something off. Like you were calling me to be a lead pastor, but not for FAC. But the day I received my call, it was very apparent that I was supposed to be the lead pastor of FAC. So God's call has been fulfilled. So if you guys want to fire me next week, we're good, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> but since this week is the start of my 40-hour work week uh, as lead pastor, I really do think that today I owe it to you all to cast some vision for our church. To say it another way, I wish to give you a road map and clarify some expectations so that you won't be blindsided with change. It, I've heard it explained this, by, this way by a, a great leader. He said, when you're the leader of something and you're trying to go a direction, you have to uh, turn your turn signal on. 
So if we're on the, the freeway and we're going 60 miles an hour, and I know I need to take the next exit, but I don't know when it's coming, and it's foggy, and it's a little shadowy, and uh, I'm just cruising along, and you're the passenger, and you have no idea where we're going. You have no idea that I'm going to be making a turn. When I see that last minute turn, if I don't have a signal or if I don't notify you that we're going to be turning, when I whip off the freeway, you're going to lean this way and then you're going to snap back and bust your head against the glass and that's not going to be fun for anybody. So as a leader, I need to at least have my turn signal on. I may not know where the exit is, but I know that's the exit we're going to take. I need to let the church know the direction that we are trying to go. So when we do make a change that might seem a little sudden, you at least know that it was coming, you just weren't sure when kind of like Christ's second coming. We need to know that it's coming, but we're not sure when. <clears throat> so I, I feel like I owe it to you guys to cast some vision for our church for the next little while. Um, some of you know that our church is going through what's called the peak process. And this is a huge church survey. It takes about seven months. And essentially our district comes in and they evaluate all sorts of different aspects of our church. And they give us kind of scores and they help us come up with a plan to refine and to, to better uh, equip ourselves to handle some of these situations and some of these important elements. Here are the nine elements that the peak process covers. Uh, while going through this, we're going to learn about spiritual leadership, personal growth, missions focus, loving community, worship gatherings, vision align alignment, alliance partnership, financial stewardship, and effective organization. These are the things that we're going to be diving into. We're really going to get refined. We're going to get organized. And during this process, our church will end up with a very strong vision and the right systems in place to achieve that vision. It's actually one of the most healthy things that this church has probably ever gone through. So we're going through that together. But that's not going to be finished till fall. So right now, we don't have a strong vision. We don't have a strong mission. We're kind of floundering. It looks like this. Have you guys seen the deadliest catch where they go catch those giant Alaskan king crab? Okay, massive vessels. They handle some of the worst conditions in the sea. Sometimes bad things happen on the ocean. So we were a crabbing vessel, and we just crashed really hard. And so what we all have done is we have jumped out of the boat into one of those inflatable life rafts. Okay, so we're sitting in this life raft for the next seven months while we try to get rescued by our new boat, which will come through peak. Um, but some of us leaders have our little bicycle pump, and we're just trying to pump and keep that life raft around. But the reality is, is the life raft that we're in right now will not sustain us. If we don't go through peak, if we don't get vision, if we don't build systems, we will fall apart. But we have to build those now. And it's going to be a little challenging, and things are going to slip through the cracks, and we're going to experience growing pains, and we're going to be uncertain about some things. But... In the meantime, God has given me a vision for our church, and it's this. Church, we are going to be simply healthy. We are going to be simply healthy. That is our vision. So say it with me, church. Simply healthy. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's simple. It's simple and healthy. That's what it is. I like that, Gary. Thank you. Uh, in case you didn't know, running a church is actually very complex. Uh, it's not just preparing a message and a worship set every Sunday. What, what happens on Sunday service is not all that we do. Uh, it, it's quite complex. There's, there's actually a business aspect of our church. We're technically a nonprofit, right? We have laws that we have to obey. Um, and if everyone real quick could look at this man that's sitting kind of near the front, his name is Ken, and give him a round of applause. <laughs> Ken keeps us in check. And he's checked us on a few things that saved our skin a few times. Ken works his tail off. He, he works more volunteer hours than any single person ever has probably for FAC. He's an amazing man. We're thankful to have him. We can't get real simple with what Ken does. <laughs> It's going to be complex because it deals with government, it deals with payroll, it deals with taxes, it deals with all those things. But God has given us kin. He's given us kin to keep us floating through these things. But there's many other aspects of a church. For example, we have Sunday service. We do have youth group. We have men's and women's group. We have a dance program that runs through here. And all these things do take tremendous effort. 
They're not easy. And church, the reality is, is we do not currently have the horsepower to keep everything running. We just don't. We lost Pastor John, and Pastor John did a ton of work. He is no longer here. I've assumed a lot of that work. It's not my gifting. Anyone here knows Richard's not an admin guy, okay? He's crazy. It's a good kind of crazy, though. But we do have Ken. Ken's done a lot of work. We've got a strong board that's assuming some of that work. But things are complex. And so in order for us to function and to stay afloat in this life raft, we have to get simply healthy. And so what is simply healthy? It means that every single ministry will now only have two requirements. This is the simple part of our church. The two requirements are this, and Matthew has some slides for us. First requirement, every ministry must glorify God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Church, if our ministries, if what we do does not bring honor and glory to God, we are going to stop doing it. We don't have time to waste. We don't have energy to waste. God must be glorified in all that we do. Man should not be glorified. We love Ken. We honor him. But we don't glorify Ken. We thank him. I think you guys appreciate what I do up here, what Brian does up here, what all of our worship team does. But we do not glorify them. We glorify God because God is working through them. Amen. Right? So the first requirement is every ministry must glorify God. The second is this. Every ministry must edify and build up the church. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16, it says this. So Christ gave himself. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the, pro the pastors and the teachers to do what? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here or there by every wind of teaching and by the, coming, the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is who? Christ. From him, the whole body, joined together and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Church, you heard what Brian read in 2 Peter. It talks about all these lovely traits of goodness and love. And it tells us that we need to have all of these traits, these godly traits as Christians in Neutral measure, in decreasing measure, no, in increasing measure. Why? Did anyone catch the why? So that we will not become unproductive or inefficient in God's kingdom. How many of you want to get to heaven and say, oh, I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, and that's all I did, and Jesus says, you could have done more. You were unproductive. You were inefficient because you wouldn't grow. We can't do that. So every ministry at FAC will glorify God and will build up the church. If what we are doing is not building up the church, then we're going to stop doing it because we don't have the time. We don't have the energy. So we will look at our ministries and we will not look at them through the lens of personal preference. I'll say that again. We will not look at ministries through the lens of personal preference. Oh, don't make me say it. Oh, I don't like that style of music. I don't like the way he preaches. I don't like the carpet in this room. I don't like how their children's ministries ran. I don't like their coffee. Church, we will not use personal preference in this church. 
we will ask these two questions. Does it glorify God, and is it building up the church? And if it's yes, guess what we're going to be? Happy. We're going to be happy and healthy because it's simple. And we don't have the, the, the horsepower and the time to be complex right now. I'm not saying that we won't get there. I'm not saying that we won't build up amazing ministries that take a lot of horsepower, but we don't have it right now. So we need to be simple. Are we glorifying God? And are we, as a collective church, leaving better equipped? It is that simple. Now, what's it mean to be healthy? Matthew 22, 36 through 40 says this. It says, teacher, what is the greatest command in the law? Many of you know this. Jesus replied, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, the prophets hang on these two commandments. We fulfill the entire law by loving our Lord, our God, and loving our neighbor. So if you ask me, church, what is healthy? Healthy is growing in your love of God and your love of others. A healthy Christian has a growing desire to know God in a deeper way. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. A healthy Christian is rooted and grounded in the gospel itself. A growing Christian knows in their love and understanding of the truths of the gospel. They understand the gospel and they love the gospel. A healthy Christian tries to see all of life as a service rendered to God. Simply put, meaning, I want my life to glorify God. A healthy Christian has communion with God, not just here at the table once a month at FAC, but has communion with Him through words and prayers, the reading of His scripture. A healthy Christian is growing in their understanding of God's word. A healthy Christian is growing in their love for the Christian brothers and sisters and deepening their bonds of relationship and service within the local church. A healthy Christian is serious about their relationship with their family members that are lost. They understand that they are called to be missionaries inside of their family. A healthy Christian fights their sins, and not alone. We'll get to this in one minute. But a healthy Christian is willing to let others into their lives to help them fight their sin battles. You are not meant to carry it alone. Have you ever tried to move a couch out of your house by yourself? One of them big sectionals that still has the bed in there, you know? Ain't happening. That's a heavy couch. Get one more person. Still hard, but it actually becomes possible. That's how sin is. It's heavy. You can't carry it on your own. Christ has set us free. He's given us the power through the Holy Spirit. But how does Christ want us to work? Together. A healthy Christian is a growing Christian, just like what Brian read. We should not be content with status quo. Every day, I want to wake up and be a better Christian and a better follower of Christ than I was the day before. So that was a lot of information for being healthy. But I do want to simplify this further. And so this is our statement, and Matthew can put it up on the board. Being simply healthy means glorifying God and strengthening the church by authentically pursuing a relationship with Jesus and each other. This is what we're going to do. When we're done with peak, this might change. But for the time being, FAC will be simply healthy. That's how we're going to measure our ministries. That's how we're going to measure success. Are we glorifying God? Is the church being strengthened? And are we in an environment where we can be real? Church, I don't want to play church anymore. 
You guys want to keep faking it? What does that get us? Nothing. That gets us what the world gets. Social media, that's all it is, is fake. I'm going to post the best parts of my life so that you can look at them and you can compare the worst parts of your life to them so you'll feel worse about yourself. I'm not trying to do that in the church. I want to be in the trenches in the mud with you guys. I want to be like, yeah, you are a sinner. I am too, but guess what? We've been washed clean. But yeah, you know what? We're still working on this, so let's work it out together. Let's be genuine. Let's be authentic. When we, when we pray to God, we're not going to just do the surface level. Thank you for the food. Amen. We're going to get real with them. God, I can't do this. Philippians chapter 2. It, it, it calls us to be like Christ, which is an impossible task. How many of you are really good at being like Christ? If you read a little further, it actually says, pray that God will do the work for you so you can be like Christ. Like, we don't have to try to have it all figured out. We're going to do it together. We're going to ask him to help us. I'm so free because of that truth. I hope you are too. So being simply healthy means glorifying God, strengthening the church by authentically pursuing a relationship with Jesus and each other. Can I get an amen? amen. Are you good with that vision? Yes. Awesome. So here's what you can expect. This is where it gets, I had to get you excited first. Because <laughs> now you're going to be like, oh, the change is coming. Church services will more than likely get out early each week. We're not going to change our time. We're going to be 10 to 1130. Um, but we're going to be willing to, to end at 11, and I'm going to really encourage you guys to hang out for 30 minutes and talk. The reason they got to be shorter is because I am working my tail off in administration to build job descriptions and systems for our church, <laughs> and that is consuming my time. I don't have 10 to 15 hours to write a sermon for you guys. You're going to get a shorter sermon, but that's okay, as long as it glorifies God and it strengthens the church. Amen? Amen? Worship will be simplified, meaning we won't be bringing a new song each week. We will learn new songs, but we will learn them together, and we will learn them slowly, because by doing so, we will glorify God, and we will strengthen the church. This one is going to hurt a lot of people. Youth group is now going to be from 6 to 7. I am still your youth director. That job has not been passed off yet. We are praying for the person to come in to take that responsibility. But in the meantime, we're going from a two-and-a-half-hour youth program to a one-hour youth program. Because I used to spend over five hours a week preparing messages that were fun and engaging for the students, and I was able to keep, for the most part, high schooler and middle schooler's attention span for one hour in the Word. It's pretty impressive. We're not going to be able to do that no more. That's going to suffer. But still, we are going to glorify God with our devotions, and we are going to build those kids up. Amen. Men's and women groups will be reevaluated. If you like what it's doing right now, it's going to get looked at. I'm not saying it's going to change, but it's going to get looked at. Children's church will be reevaluated. There's a few individuals, and I've always kind of leaned this way, that actually like kids in church. As everyone sees right now, kids are in church. Yeah. That was not planned. Uh, pray for Valerie. She uh, is feeling really ill right now, so she didn't come. She's our uh, inter interim children's church worker. But um, I, I like kids in church. I think it gives the, ch the, the children in church a chance to actually edify the church. Yeah. See, oftentimes we think that we need to be the ones pouring on to the kids, and I'm sitting there thinking these kids got spiritual gifts that God has given them. Why aren't they here up front, right? Have faith like a child but we're going to reevaluate it. I'm not saying I have the right answer, but we're going to reevaluate it. This is a big one. We won't be running our big vacation Bible school this year. We've been doing that traditionally for years and years and years. But it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of horsepower. We don't have it. So we're reevaluating. There is a, a, a chance for us to partner with Child Evangelism Fellowship where they will bring in the volunteers. They'll bring in the teachers. We provide some snacks and a few other volunteers, and we still run a week-long program. We're looking at that. We don't know. But there will be no VBS this year. And there will be many more changes to come. But I want to let you know that we will evaluate each and every ministry through the lens of Simply Healthy. Are you okay with that? 
So part of this journey is that we will um, dive into a few different series for our sermons. I'm actually really excited about this. For the month of April, uh, we're going to focus on what mourning, suffering, and loss looks like. As I mentioned earlier, we lost John and we lost Diane. We need to mourn that, church. And there's a healthy way to do that. And the principles we're going to learn next week are going to apply directly to any aspect of mourning, loss, and suffering that you go through. It's going to be beautiful. We're going to learn how to mourn authentically and hopefully do it together. Because grief and suffering is very prevalent. Um, That's going to take us through the month of April. Jake Beatty's going to preach uh, the third Sunday of April. I forget the exact date. And he's going to follow that same Uh, concept of suffering, mourning, and loss, Uh, but he's going to start to shift directions and explain how we can still have hope while we're mourning. And then the last Sunday of April, we will talk about hopeful mourning. In the month of May, we're going to be diving into what is going to be called the gift series. My goal with this month is actually to meet with each of you as a couple or individually. Uh, I want to interview you guys. I want to know if you know what your spiritual gifts are, what your natural talents are, I basically want to get a profile on you to understand what your gifts are. Because church, if you are called to do ministry, I want to make that available to you. If your ministry is not supposed to be in this church and it's supposed to be in the workplace, great. But I want to encourage you in that. I want to help you guys actually get released to go do what God is calling you to do. So we're going to be learning spiritual gifts and understanding gifts. We're going to be placing people in roles if they're called into them. Once we get done with our spiritual gifts uh, series, we're going to go, and this one's not locked in, but it's where the heart's kind of pulling and Candy's affirmed this. We're probably going to go through a gospel, and we're going to walk the walk of Jesus together. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. So now you know what to expect from the pulpit for the next few months. Um, Now I want you guys to know what to expect from your pastor and his family. First things first. I don't have my phone. What time is it? Thank you. I'm really trying to get us out on time. <clears throat> this is what to expect from your pastor. I will lead by example by pursuing a simply healthy life with Christ and others. I will give FAC all that I can. However, I will not sacrifice my family on the altar of ministry. meaning I will balance my work and family life. I will preach what the Lord has placed on my heart. Expository, exegetical, and topical preaching will take place from this pulpit. I actually don't view that one is greater than the other. I believe they all have their place within the church. What matters is not what or how I wish to preach, but what or how God wants me to preach. I don't like to handcuff myself. I don't like to be a stick in the mud. So if God says you're going to go through a book and you're going to go line by line, I will go through a book. If God says you need to handle addiction in your church and preach on addiction, I will do a topical sermon on addiction. What matters is what Christ wants. Amen? Amen. Lastly, I will strive to hold up the qualifications of an elder by the power of the Holy Spirit that is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus 1, and 1 Peter 5. That is a tough hill to climb to be an elder. Um, Casey and I got to talk for a while. We talked to like, is our church going to be the church that's the 80% rule for elders, where if they meet 80% of the qualifications that they can be an elder, is it a 100% rule? We're navigating that. I'm letting you guys know I'm going to try to be 100% qualified to be an elder to this church. Can you get on with that? Now we get tough. Now I will ask that you understand this. When FAC hired me as a full-time pastor, they did not hire my wife. We are not a buy one, get one free operation. Although it has been a long-standing tradition that the pastor preaches and the wife leads the children's church or the women's group, this will not be the case. Ministry is a calling. At this point, my wife has not been called to lead those ministries. My wife has been called to support her husband as he commits to vocational ministry. And she has been called to raise her six children in a way that honors our Lord. (laughs) 
Church, I will not allow you to put unfair expectations on my wife or my children. Too many pastors' families are wrecked because of this position. And I'm going to defend them before I defend you. Their father has committed to leading a church in direct opposition of Satan and his armies. The battles that we will face will be intense and ongoing. We are not some celebrity TV show that you guys get to dress up and determine how we do and live our life. We're not clowns who are going to put on a little hat and do a little dance up here for you. We're real humans who love the Lord and are in the trenches with you guys. We are your brothers and sisters in Christ. My wife has her hands full between six kids and a husband who is empathetic to a fault. Trust me when I say it will be better for the church for her to support me on the home front than to lead children's church. She has gifts that she will be using to build the church, much like I'm asking you guys to use. But she will grow into them as our children get older and time becomes available. Church, I desire to be an effective church. I was talking with Russ uh, and Val the other day, and they were visiting some family and, uh, out of state, and they went to a church, and they heard the pastor say this, that's that we're going to fight to win this city. This church's vision was that they will fight, that they understand that there is a battle going on, and they are fighting for Christ's kingdom to win the city. Church, I want to fight with you guys. I want Christ's kingdom to be here in Whatcom County. Church, it is my prayer that God will use FAC to break chains of addiction, to restore broken marriages, to heal the sick, to support the orphans and the window, widows, to help fight mental illness with sound biblical counseling, and lastly, to see souls saved every single week because of the ministry that God is doing through our church. But before we can do any of that, we need to be simply healthy. Being simply healthy means glorifying God and strengthening the church by authentically pursuing a relationship with Jesus and each other. Amen? Amen. Church, we're going to take communion together. And there's a few reasons we take communion, but the one that is most important is because Jesus told us to. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Church communion is an opportunity for us to remember what he has done for us. But it's also meant to be shared with one another. I think we forget that. We take our little bread and our little cup and we just kind of think it's all here, but... It's actually a group thing. So while taking the cup today, I want to ask you this. I want you to ask yourself, do I want to join FAC in the journey of being simply healthy? Is this the local church body that I wish to join, share communion with, struggle with, and be real with? If so, church, let's do it. And if you're unsure, that's okay too. Take your time. Pray. We're not going anywhere. Well, except towards the direction of simply healthy, which should lead us to Christ. But if this isn't your church, that's okay. God has given us so many churches in Walken County. We're not going to be the church that tries to hold on to your ankle and not let you go. We don't do this. We do this. When God brings people into our life, we're going to accept them. And when God takes people away, we're going to let them go. There's nothing wrong with that. But I do believe if you're going to be part of this church, you're going to see some amazing things happen. We are not a cookie-cutter operation. We're a bunch of weirdos in a church. That's why we all fit in so well. And diversity is a blessing. And I believe that not only in the congregation, but in other churches. So if God's called you to another church, go to another church. Help their vision come through. Build God's kingdom. 
If it's not through FAC, go somewhere else. But we want you here. But it's important to know that you're not needed here. Some people just got hit there a little bit. Church, you're wanted here. But you're not needed here. I'm wanted here. But God doesn't need me here. He has all that he needs. But if you want to be a part of this journey, I pray that when you take communion, you really have that conversation with God. Because as, as for this house, we will serve the Lord. And we will do so by being simply healthy. Let's pray, and I'll have a few elders come up, and we'll take communion. Gary's going to play us some music, too. Tell me, Father, I thank you for this church, Lord. I thank you for the vision that you've given us. God, I pray that our church can fulfill this, that we can be a simply healthy church. Lord, I pray as visitors come through this door, they will look at us and they will realize that we are not just some show. We're not some entertainment venue for them to come in and get entertained and go home. No, Lord, we are a church that is in the trenches. We're fighting a battle, not just between ourselves, Lord, in our own interpersonal way, but a spiritual battle. And God, we are winning territory for your kingdom. God, I pray that you continue to handle so much of the complexity of this church, Lord. Help us remove what needs to be removed, Lord. Help us build up what needs to be built up. God, I can continue to pray for the workers to come through. God, you keep telling me that we have everybody we need here. So God, if that's the case, build them up. Let them rise up. Let them step into the roles that you have called for them. We're done playing church. We're ready to build your kingdom. We're ready to glorify you, strengthen each other, and be real with one another. Lord, as we take this cup, I pray that we do it in all seriousness, understanding what you did for us on the cross and how beautiful that was, that you took our sins. But even further than that, Lord, that you rose from the grave, that you conquered death and sin, Lord, that you've given us everything that we need through the power of your Holy Spirit. We love you. We thank you. Lord, help us be simply healthy. Amen. For your body, we thank you that it was broken and crushed for our sins, Lord. We thank you that you took the burden and the weight of our sin so that we could be in right relationship with you. Our vision of Simply Healthy means being authentically 
true in our relationships, not just with each other, but also with you. So God, help us do that now. We pray this in Jesus' name. We're reminded that this is my body given for you to take this in remembrance of me. You may take bread. At this point, we're going to pass the cup. And like John likes to say, it takes a little longer to do this. So if anybody has a word, we're going to open up the floor. Now I'm trusting you guys here not to get wild on me. There's power in this microphone. But if you have a word, I would ask that you give it now. that God gave me, but first I want to say I'm so glad that when I slammed Pastor Finch, he was Richard, and when I went to the board, they showed me nothing but love, but I'm glad I got it out there because I can't never do that again. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiving power. The scripture that God gave me is from Philippians, the third chapter, 13 through 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I was driving my car in Crescent City. This is a me story. I told my grandkids, rather than talk on the phone, if you're going to text, put it in the trunk. Don't touch it. Don't read any text. Don't answer. I drove like that from the time, almost from the time I started driving with a cell phone. I was driving, and instead of going to the McDonald's that was right there, I wanted to find the Burger King because I wanted a Whopper with cheese. What happened was my cell phone went out, and I lost my GPS. So I looked down, I was talking to my friend Darren, I said, oh, I lost my G, that's all I got out. I got slammed, it tore my car to shreds, all because I got distracted and took my eyes off the road. I had a $48 full coverage insurance policy, now I pay $364 a month. I had to get another car and my car payment went straight through the roof. Why? Because for one split second I got distracted. Everything that was said today was saying keep your focus. Whatever God has called you to do, do it. Don't let anything sidetrack you. Don't let sin sidetrack you. Don't let another human being sidetrack you. Keep your eyes on the prize. Paul's prize was heaven, but he didn't reach back to those things that were wrong. He didn't look back to all the things that had happened to him. I held on to Pastor John until I got this scripture. He's still my piano teacher, but I held on to him. But God said, don't look backwards. Look forward and reach for the prize. Whoever the pastor is, you serve that pastor with your whole heart. Whoever the board is, you respect that board. Whoever the elders are, you respect. Because if you do anything outside of that, you're going to be sidetracked and distracted. So whatever plans God has given you, whatever purpose you have in your life, whatever your passion is, keep your eyes on the prize and we'll all make it home. If not now, then later. In Jesus' name, that's my word for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blood that was shed on that cross. I uh, become lost for words when I think about how mutilated your body was. It's tough to think of our Savior, Jesus, who did no wrong to suffer that kind of punishment. God, we thank you for it because it set us free. We thank you for the new covenant that is your blood. God, I don't know if I would have made it in Old Testament days. I thank you for the men and women that went through that to prove our desperate need for a Savior. So Lord, we take this cup 
except in the new covenant you have with us. Amen. We're going to have the worship team come up. We've got one more closer, and we'll get out of here on time. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name, Your rich in love. You're slow to anger Your name is great And your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons For my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul to worship His holy name, sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near. And my time has come, and still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore. Just bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship Your holy name Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name For all my soul, I worship.
worship your holy name. Yes, I'll worship your holy name. Lord, I'll worship your holy name. Thank <laughs> you. 